Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today for our COVID-19 conversation. I'm John Streit, Managing Editor and Writer for Operation Smile, and alongside uh, Laura Gonzalez, our Digital Content Manager, we uh, spend a lot of our time working really closely with all of our stories uh, uh, dealing with the COVID-19 response of our organization. And we really just wanna give a heartfelt thanks to you guys for joining us this afternoon so that we can connect with uh, some wonderful colleagues of ours from Nicaragua who are doing amazing things to stay in touch and reach our patients. Um, if you're joining us and you happen to be a frontline healthcare worker, we extend our uh, extra heartfelt thanks to you for taking time out from uh, saving lives every day to join us. We really appreciate it. Um, I'll kick it over to Laura, who will be moderating uh, the questions and chat portion of this uh, webinar today. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I'm excited to have you all here to hear about the amazing work our colleagues in Nicaragua are carrying out. Um, I just want to let you know if you have questions throughout, you can input them into the chat and we will reserve a few minutes at the end of this conversation to answer any questions that come through. However, do not fear if we run out of time, we will send you personalized answers to any questions that you ask and I'll be answering um, some of the simpler ones if we have them already and I'll kick it back to you, John. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Laura. Uh, and yeah, I'm just really excited to introduce three of our colleagues from uh, Nicaragua and, and a regional director as well. So uh, with that, I'll introduce Indiana Sue. She's our regional director and, uh, her, and she manages country portfolios of Dominican Republic, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Uh, Indiana served for eight years as the executive director of Operation Smile in Nicaragua before becoming the regional director of those countries in 2018. Uh, as a regional director, Indiana provides leadership and support to our organization's uh, work in her countries uh, with a focus on business operations, strategic planning, program development, stakeholder engagement, strategic initiatives, and special projects. Welcome, Indiana. Next, we have Tatiana Morales, Operation Smile Nicaragua's executive director. She got her start with Operation Nic Nicaragua as a volunteer nurse and then joined the staff as a patient care coordinator in 2015, become, becoming the center coordinator in 2016, then a program coordinator in 2017, and executive director in 2019. So she's seen a whole spectrum of roles with Operation Smile Nicaragua. And this unique experience strikes a balance of patient and volunteer ad advocacy with organizational strategy to help move the foundation forward. Welcome, Tatiana. And then we have Scarlett Gomez, our speech therapist with Operation Smile in Nicaragua. Scarlett is a speech language pathologist who's worked as a speech therapy provider for Operation Smile in Nicaragua for the past three years. Since there's no degree for speech language pathology in Nicaragua, uh, she received her degree from Iona College in New York and has trained with Operation Smile volunteers at medical missions and at our care center in Managua over the past three years. Welcome all and thank you for joining our conversation today. So we'll get right into it. Um, Indiana, as regional director for the Dominican Republic, Guatemala and Nicaragua, can you speak about the ways the countries in which you work have been adapting to serve their community's needs during the pandemic? Well, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to showcase what local foundations do around the world. All of our countries have done an outstanding job supporting COVID during this pandemic. I currently work supporting Guatemala, Dominican and Nicaragua. In the case of Guatemala, we have provided medical supplies to attend our mission hospital, which attends pediatric patients. And they have teamed up with Rotary and United Way to support 125 families during this, this outbreak with food and hygiene kits. Dominican Republic supported with um, medical supplies in hospital, we perform missions. And then in Nicaragua, we, su we, su we are supporting with medical supplies in one of the referral hospitals. We actually host our missions and now we are teaming up with American Nicaraguan Foundation, a United Way rep in our country to support patients with um, food kits for food kits and hygiene kits. Oh, that's amazing. Well, tell us more about some of the first steps that, that were taken after the pandemic was uh, declared and what were your key consideration for your teams? So first was basically assessing the pandemic in the country we work, knowing what the context was, and then work to benefit hospitals, but also our patients in our countries. I think malnutrition around lack is a fact. And to be able to have a chance to fight a virus, they need to be healthy. We wanted to be able to help hospitals and frontlines 
workers as well as our, some of our volunteers who are there. But also we wanted to try to help patients avoid getting there. So food kits was also our priority. So basically the main steps were towards trying to support our patients with food and hygiene kits and then with uh, a bit of PPE for hospitals, but also for our volunteers in the front lines. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, it's really staggering to think about the food shortages and the and and how that's affecting people all over the world. Uh, so we really appreciate you reaching out like that. Uh, this one's for Tatiana in Indiana. Uh, when COVID nineteen was declared a pandemic, your team was delivering surgical care to patients at a medical program in Managua. Can you speak to the safety precautions that your team put in place uh, in order to ensure that everybody, from patients to volunteers to staff, stayed healthy during that mission? I think when COVID was gaining force affecting all of our countries, our team and headquarters were really prompt in communicating with our local foundations to explore our scenarios to either cancel or support missions. And the pandemic wasn't affecting our country yet. And I just think that volunteers board and staff decided that we should just carry on the mission at, in, until that first case was announced. Um, I also think that Effectively, we did stop on the same day, but I'll let Tatiana speak more to the decisions and how um, the whole COVID affected Nicaragua. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for this opportunity and join us. Well, uh, first, I think we have an amazing volunteers and staff and board members, uh, but as Indiana said, at that time in our country, we didn't have any case of COVID-19, but as a foundation, we already had an action protocol. Uh, our main measure in with the volunteers and the patient and the staff um, was an education uh, on hand agent. Uh, we made information uh, on symptom prevention uh, of COVID-19 to info um, during the evaluation we double check our patient and from the time uh, they arrive at the screening, if the patient had a fever, uh, we remove the patient and the, it wasn't admitted uh, with the other patient because our first thing in this mission and all the moment is the safety. Absolutely, and I know safety had to be what led your team to the tough decision to postpone the remaining surgeries and end that program early. Can you tell us more about that tough decision you guys had to make on the ground? Um, during the surgical, um, during the surgical week, uh, when the first uh, case was officially announced, it was a a, a bit uh, of sad feeling. Uh, not only because what our patient will go through, uh, also, but also what our country will be fencing. Uh, even though our volunteer wanted to continue, but we never, and the, the first thing was the safety for our patient, for yeah. our volunteer, for our staff, for all the thing. Uh, the re for that reason, we decided to finish the mission early than planner. Uh, it was a little, um, was a, a, a sad, but uh, the first thing was a, a safety. Yeah, absolutely. I know it just had to be heartbreaking to have to tell families who had traveled, who had uh, you know sacrificed so much on their end to be a part of that. Uh, to tell them that they couldn't uh, receive surgery because of this. I mean, it had to be tremendously difficult. Uh, what was it like having to break the news to families during the mission? And how else are we staying in contact with patients' families who still are needing surgery? Well, um, the first, it was a very uh, emotional moment. Uh, we had many feelings on where sad, but we were to pray uh, to see how far the team had done for in four days um, in, uh, they had come together and to discover 74 new smile we were feeling with hope not, uh, knowing uh, that in the mind of difficult time we had a great volunteer uh, who they 
are willing to continue for our patient, for our country, and for our family of Operation Smile. The last patient, I think the last patient uh, feeling sad, but we told with them uh, in that we will to continue in the better time. Now we are uh, in constant communication with them uh, and, and, and they're in their our clinic online. In that, in this time, the psychology and the speech therapy is, is the main support for them. Yeah, and Scarlett, I know um, you had a very hands-on experience uh, talking to families when that tough decision was made. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, hi, hello everyone. Thank you for having us and thank you for joining us. Um, so I was the one actually to give the, uh, to give the news to the patients. We had around 15 patients that were scheduled for Friday and we did the last surgery day on Thursday. Um, it was a really bittersweet moment because I was like so nervous to talk to them um, because I didn't know how I could tell them that what you've been uh, expecting and dreaming of um, can happen right now. We, had, yeah, we I just made so many promises that we, as soon as we could, we, we were um, gonna call them and, and reach to them so they can uh, have a new date for the surgery because we have pri we had primary lips on babies and we had like one primary lip on an 11 year old and like most of them were like really sad I'm gonna be honest some of them were mad but they understood the situation and um, I actually one of the volunteer one of the patients said okay so I don't have anything to else to do here at the hospital do you want me to help in any way oh. um, so yeah and he helped us a little bit with the charts and all that stuff we just wow. uh, we were trying to um, uh, figure everything out and to be able to leave the hospital as soon as we could as, we, as soon as we uh, finished with the surgeries for that day so yeah bittersweet it had to be done for the safety of all of us. So, yeah. Yeah, that's so sweet to hear that uh, people were willing to pitch in and help out how they could. I think that kind of solidarity is what we need more in the world right now. Yeah, um, yeah so back to Tatiana, Indiana. Um, many of our teams around the world are donating much needed supplies and equipment to support local health systems. How have our efforts helped local health systems in Nicaragua? How have they helped our patients? I think right now there's no country that was prepared for this pandemic and we have supported with supplies to help protect our front lines, which a lot of them are volunteers for Operation Smile. It has helped to some to it has helped to deal at some degree with how we could treat properly people that are trying to access care um, without the fear of being exposed. And I think that we also have been advocating for safe surgery and safe spaces since Operation Smile creation. And our patients know we have them in our mind and purpose. We are making efforts to continue treatment online when possible, um, as well as providing food kits to patients. I think there's a, even like a, a second kind of wave of funds we are trying to gain for, for them. Um, we are also making efforts to continue their treatment online. And then when we can, we're gonna make it um, safe as possible for them to return to the clinic. I think also that it's really important the support of the food kits. I do want to highlight that that we sure. have as regional directors been supporting foundations around the world with this because our patients, it's crucial for them to also be ready when we are ready to host missions. It's really important for them to be healthy, to just be ready up and say, well, I could get operated as soon as it's, it's possible or the organization begins programmatic um, activities. And for most of our patients, they are part of an informal task force. They don't get a, a steady salary. They don't get like um, a, a steady income. So most of them, even in social distancing, it's really easy for us to say social distancing, like take care of yourself. But there are some people that actually um, need the money, need the salary for that day. And social distancing is not helping them to provide for their family. So I think that we have found ways of being for our volunteers, but also being for our patients, even while they're at home and away in surgery. So yeah, I'll pass it up to Tatiana. Okay, 
I think nobody's prepared for a situation like this one. Uh, we are going through and Nicaragua is not the exception, uh, but OSN, OSA, OSN with the support of OSI, we have provided supplies for uh, to some hospital we wish we work. Uh, it is incredible, incredible to know that thank of the type of support, we are not only supporting one adequate protection for our medical team, uh, many of them volunteers and other uh, who are not uh, not volunteer but who are in the front line in care to many patients and even more. So for all patients who live in the vulnerable situation, not only do for their physical condition, but also uh, do for the, their socioeconomical conditions. Uh, in this moment, OSI support is magnific magnif sorry, magnificent uh, because we can support um, the situation. In this situation, we can support our health system and many, many families too. So, many families need us, um, support for the situation for this situation and this in this moment uh, they have a uh, really a uh, help um and i think and this this is a great moment we grow for our patients thank you uh, Scarlett, uh, because of the virus, we've had to postpone surgical treatments for many of our patients around the world, but what else are we doing to care for our patients beyond surgery? We are trying to provide as much uh, uh, as many services as we can. Uh, we have been doing consultations over the phone or video calls with the pediatrician, the nutritionist. Some, uh, it's all the co that those types of consultations that you could uh, do, and it, it could be like done via uh, screen so the, the mom the mom calls them and uh, explains whatever is going on or explains the routine that their baby's having or whatever it um it doesn't go well with the baby and we are trying to and with the nutritionists we're trying to for the kids to as indiana said to keep getting weight to be healthy uh to be in uh, their best shape ever and with the psychologist, she's available for everyone that wants to uh, have any kind of support um, for either the patient or any of their relatives, because we know this is a completely different situation that we've ever gone through in our lives. So it's uh, valid if they want uh, to talk to someone about it and if they're like scared or are um, afraid of whatever this means in the future in whatever kind of situation they're going through. And with speech therapy, we're just trying to uh, follow up with all of our patients. Um, we're not doing any evaluations right now, just um, continuing with our 1, uh, 1,800 patients at the clinic right now. And oh. we are also uh, having any, um, we're having more newborn babies with a cleft, either cleft lip or cleft lip and palate. So we're also, um, via online or a, a phone call the hospital let us lets us know and then we will call them and give feeding techniques and just explain the treatment and whatever uh, comes with the condition so they are prepared and so we have way more patience for us when we come back as a physical presential clinic or that's amazing. Um, I want to focus in on the nutritional aspect. And um, could you speak a little, in a little more detail why nutritional support is so important, especially for malnourished treatment? I mean, malnourished patients. And tell me a little bit more about ready to use therapeutic food and um, what we're doing with that product as well. Um, we are really uh, proud of our nutritional program right now because we are having, we're being able to follow up with the babies that we have diagnosed that are malnutrition or in a low weight. Um, and we are, we are trying to make it a more controlled way for us as a clinic or as a the ones that, that are given the treatment and for the parents to be as involved and as informed as we can. 
Um, and with the Wu or the ready to use therapeutic food, um, what uh, that brings us is to, it's a way to give um, the patient like something like uh, another resource uh, is adding from their meals, like the, the two or three meals they have a day, we have another resource that can help. And the families usually use them, not just with uh, our patient, but with the rest of the family. And it's a um, peanut butter paste that, so you can make it with anything. It's um, for sandwiches or like a like milkshake or whatever you wanna put it in with cookies. So um, the kids, if, if we're talking about kids, they love it. Um, it's like really greasy, so you can put it on anything and it helps them gain weight really fast. And so we can um, have them prepared as, uh, as soon as possible. That's really amazing. Um, and then we'll pivot into your specialty, speech therapy as well. And it's such a vital uh, element of the care that we're able to provide for people. And um, really, you know, especially with uh, those with cleft palate, how critical it is to provide this service for them, even though we're apart right now. Um, could you speak in more detail about how you've been able to deliver your therapies and just what that means to families right now to be able to receive that kind of support from you? Um, so we're doing as much as we can. We're doing the online, the video calls, we're doing phone calls, we're doing, we're sending them through WhatsApp or whatever uh, platform we can use to get, to give them stuff like videos and interactive games and uh, like pictures or uh, exercises they can practice. So it's all on hand. And what I've what they've been telling me for the little ones, they're really enjoying that their parents are at home and because they don't have to go to school like right now or just like are uh, doing little assignments for school, they are, the parents and the kids are spending way more time together. The parents are um, seeing a whole nother progress with them because they know like they are the ones that have to do it with them. At the clinic, it's me or any of the volunteers doing it with the kid and they're just watching, but now they are the ones that have to understand and uh, be able to practice whatever uh, we are doing with the kid. So that makes it a lot more um, understandable and they get way more fun out of that experience. That's awesome. Um, what what have some of the uh, parents of patients, um, what, what, what have they been saying to you and uh, you know, just, just about you know, what they're, you're able to bring to their kids? Um, they're really happy because uh, with the population that we work with, um, they, they get to spend a lot of money on travel because we are in the capital city and if they're not um, near here, it, it takes them up to four or six hours to come. So um, they just, but well, what they're doing right now is that they just get to spend on data that could be like uh, like a hundred percent less of what they were spending. And they get the materials, they get the consultation, they can ask whatever they want. They think they're, um, they feel that they're more in touch with um, every single one of us that's given the different consultations. Yeah. And they also feel um, like they have, like they feel supported. Like this is like something we've never uh, seen before, but we're just trying to keep like constant calls to see if, we, if everyone is okay. We're also giving um, any kind of information that we have about safety measures or that they can take as parents or as kids because um, here we have some schools running um, at the moment. So we're just trying to uh, make the parents understand the situation and to for everyone to be as uh, safe uh, as they can. That's really amazing. And uh, I know the work that's happening in Nicaragua right now is really pioneering and, and really doing some great things and inspiring similar activity both across Latin America and other places as well. So thank you so much for what you do and, and offering that service to people. Uh, it's really incredible. Um, I wanted to open this back up to e each of you. Um, if you had anything else that you wanted to add before we entered into our next phase of the call, which is uh, audience uh, question and answer session. Um, Indiana, anything else you'd like to add? I wanted to acknowledge all the heroes in the front line. I think we are full of respect and admiration for what you do for humanity. A big thank you, as well as to local foundations, the headquarter teams, 
my fellow Zardis that have been tremendous supporting our countries. Just please everybody keep safe and healthy. We need you all to continue doing great things. Tatiana, anything you'd like to add? Uh, Tatiana, I think you're on mute. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, okay. Yeah, it happens. <laughs> I want to say thank you th thank for the support of each one of those great people who are always support us, um, board donors, and uh, staff member, OSI, and the most important thing in this, in this moment is our volunteers who are on the front line and who are the true hero. Uh, we are pro, pro of their courage and thank you, thank for your um, time and your help us. And many thanks. Thank you. Scarlett, anything else? Yeah, I just want to say that I think the situation is making us grow stronger and to remind ourselves not to take anything for granted. This is an opportunity for us to make our time here valuable, to help as many people as we can, to be as em empathetic as we can. And I just want to thank to everyone that's working towards making this a better uh, space for us, a time for us, and to everyone that's working at the hospitals and the rest of the volunteers and staff and all of you that may be behind the stage, but are making a lot of things happen. Oh, thank you so much, and, and thanks to uh, each of you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, well, I'm really excited because we have a, a bunch of questions coming in from our audience, so we'll go ahead and, and get started with that portion of this. Um, our first comes from Helen. Um, so Operation Smiles patients come from a wide area, so how do the food and hygiene kits reach the families? So for many of my countries, it has been a hard task, but we have so two, it was, has been two ways. So first we did partner with some organizations like United Way, Rotary International, um, American Nicaraguan Foundation and others. And first we did get some, um, some products from them. So we teamed up. Second, they do have presence in some areas that our patients are. And thirdly, we have been actually conveying or like asking them to come to a specific point where we deliver the the, the hygiene and food kits. It has been really, really a challenge, but I think our teams and our partnerships have endured to just keep benefiting patients. Awesome. Our next question comes from Linda. How is Operation Smile Nicaragua able to help any families by providing uh, technology, you know, through the phone or an iPad or an iPhone, uh, so that these remote meetings with nutritionists, speech pathologists, et cetera, can occur? So I think the question is, are we able to um, provide the physical like telephones or um, iPads to patients so that we can reach them? Um, Scarlett, I think uh, this would be a question for you. I know that you have other ways of delivering therapy if we don't have internet connectivity. Yeah, well, we're not physically giving them the, the patients any kind of uh, technology, but what we're doing is we're uh, right now, the patient coordinator is doing a study with uh, to know what are the patients that are able to get um, uh, internet or had any kind of device so we can know which are of our patients uh, are able to get that kind of consultation and for the other ones that are that are not able we are just trying to make um, as much as use as we can of, of the phone call itself like we're trying to explain to them as easy as we can or for them to tell us what uh, they have around them that we can use for therapy. For th in, in my area, you don't need to have like a lot of technology for it to work. So what I do is like give them like clear instructions uh, to, um, to do whatever we have to do with the kids or for the um, teenager or the adult to, to um, actually know what they, what they have to look out for or listen to when we're uh, working together. But um, it, we have a lot, a, like a lot of patients. If we have no way of getting to everyone in that way. Sure. But we're just trying to make uh, as much as we can of the resources we have right now. 
Absolutely. Uh, that leads us right into the next question that we have from Katie. Um, about how many patients are you able to reach via video or Facebook Live or even uh, through the phone too? Uh, I think we're all curious to know uh, how many you've been able to reach. I don't have an exact number, but we, since we started in like late March, we've been able to reach around 400 or 500 patients. Wow. But yeah, and we're we're just trying to follow up with them, and we are working towards uh, reaching out to the other ones that we have. We haven't been able to tell them uh, that we are close to the clinic, or that we haven't, or maybe we called them, but we haven't been able to give the sure. consultations. For that, we're just trying to make us um, as many volunteers uh, involved in the online consultations. For its speech therapy, I have four. Uh, for psychologists, I think we have two or three. And with the nutritionist and the pediatrician, it, um, we're just trying to get uh, a lot more people so we can cover a lot more. Wow, yeah. that's really One impressive, thing honestly. <laughs> I think. One thing done. So um, this is, Julie Nicaragua has been a pioneer in trying to host this speech therapy sessions. But right now, LACRD is the Latin American and Caribbean um, my fellows, um, Ashby and said we are working towards creating a proposal to roll this out and just like, try to gain more access to patients. So just stay tuned for um, other strategies and planifications we're trying to roll out. And, and I think we are going to be able to reach many more and much more patients. I think it's super impressive that uh, you've been able to reach the amount that you have so far. I mean, if you think about the time that it takes for each call to happen and for what, what you've been able to do since uh, the pandemic uh, uh, hit is really impressive, Scarlett. And uh, Indiana, we do look forward to the future developments on expanding these programs too. Um, that leads us into our next question. Um, Helen was just sharing her thoughts of thinking about so many of our patients that don't have access to phones and the challenges of being able to provide information and to work with them. Um, Indiana, I think, that you were speaking to just that um, a, a moment ago, but um, I guess a good way to think about it is, you know, in the in the age of social distancing and all of these lockdowns and stay-at-home orders, I think it's just going to be a, a, a long-term challenge to be able to get back on the grassroots level and, and reach patients. But could you share more insight into that idea for us, please? I think that right now what we're trying to figure out first is like the volume we're trying to um benefit we do need to do a little bit of kind of like socioeconomic profiling for patients sure. we need to understand more what they have try to get quickly to whoever have the technology right now some consultations and then try to develop some other strategies for patients that um can do can gain access for example what if we identify a community leader and then they have like three patients in that community that we could actually call into the community leader and then they could kind of like um, be hosting that at their houses or at their offices. It's just like trying to find clever ways of engaging whoever doesn't have the resource and try to meet them at that stage. And I just think that um, it's gonna be, we're trying to tailor it by, by country and then by the region and how we're gonna build this out. But um, it has taken a lot of thinking and a lot of, um, support from PMs and RDs just working together to roll this out and try just try to keep on benefiting patients because I think that for social reintegration, being able to speak is just crucial. So Absolutely. you want to keep on that. Thank you so much. Um, and then we have one more question. This comes from Sophia. Um, and I think for, for you, Scarlett, can you tell us more about how you prepare to reach out to each one of the patients you've been able to call? Like what kind of preparation goes into, into having your calls when you're, when you're delivering speech therapy? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Okay. So what I do is I have all of the, uh, the, the speech files for uh, any of the patients that I was seeing at the clinic. So I have a list of every patient I'm supposed to see that day. I review it. Um, a day earlier, I see whatever that I have to, that I've been working with that patient. And because I have to do it everything through my phone. So I, I, um, I have downloaded a lot of materials and have uh, made myself a lot of materials so that they, so I can use them uh, 
during the consultation and then I send it to them if there if, if it's available through WhatsApp so they can practice on that. So it depends on whatever I'm working with sure. for the babies. We have their early stimulation like exercises and I go through with the mom via video call to see if they're doing it okay or if they have any questions with the infants and toddlers. I'm just uh, using a lot of YouTube a, big, a lot of songs and videos that I can that they can listen to during the day, and um, a lot of the materials that I'm doing I have a lot of clear instructions for the parents so that I can explain to them what they have to do, and then um, they uh, they put it in practice during the week, and then they send me videos of whatever the result they had. So I I, I now have a lot of lot of resources from patients. So that I that I can learn from and that I can use them for education uh, to volunteers to other volunteers for speech, and for the adults, we're just I'm trying to use whatever they have at home yeah. for um, what we're doing, the, the, what we're supposed to be working with, because I I used to have a lot of things that I, we could use like mirrors and like little listening tubes and all that stuff. So I'm we're just trying to make them um, a DIY kind of. If, speech materials or appliances so yeah i just review and uh i had to transform whatever i was uh working with at the clinic to have a, like an online digital form wow i think that makes that uh that number even more impressive <laughs> you've been able to reach so many in such a short period of time so thank you so so much for 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 what you do for all for all of them um mm -hmm. Laura, do we have any more questions from the audience? We've had a few more come in. Um, so this one's from Nubia, and it was originally in Spanish, so excuse me if this translation has been butchered, but she is asking, um, how have the families and, and patients responded to using the technology, and um, kind of what was their emotional response to receiving therapy from you directly, even during times like these? How, what have the reactions been um, during your consultations? A little bit mixed. It de it depends on on the age of the of the patient, because the moms are really uh, happy with whatever we're uh, with what we're doing. We send them all of the materials, and that they can just put it at home and and that. But for the older for the older ones, they are the ones that um, feel that they need to have it like a, in a physical way. But we are making sure that they can. Um, that we can continue with the process as, as much as we can. We are, for me, I'm not able to uh, actually listen with as uh, clearly as I would if I had the patient in front of me. But we're making we're making that work, and they're really happy. They're really um, they're really happy that we can continue because for them, they we have a lot of more a lot more frequently frequent sessions now because because of the travel many and they and the travel distance they had to take they could only go to the center like once or twice a month or every two months so now we're able to have it as like once a week or twice a week or um every two weeks depending on their schedule so we're um a lot of them are happy i'm not gonna say that everyone's like really really comfortable because they are like some of them are really shy with the cameras and to be able to have it be a video call or they feel a little bit um, insecure or unsure when they are at home because everyone's listening and that part we had it at the clinic that it was just like between them and me but we're making it work I'm we're also working uh, towards that with the psychologist whatever that I see that it's not working because of another issue. We are just trying to um, to make it work as a team with the both of us, and they know that we're working it together to um, help them uh, be as comfortable as they can be, to be as sure for their home to be a safe space too, and that they can practice, that they can have the consultations. So yeah, we're working with the ones that are not as comfortable, but I think we're getting through it. That's really wonderful. Um, yeah, Laura. Oh, um, I think we only have a couple more minutes. Do you think we still have some time for a question, John? Uh, I think we could do one more. Okay, 
Sounds good. Yeah. Um, so there have been a few questions along the same line, um, and either one of you ladies can answer. Indiana, maybe you might have a better idea, but um, the, the first part of the question is, how long has Operation Smile Nicaragua had an office and been providing year-round care? Kind of when were you established? And then the second part of that is, um, what about the future? What can we expect to see? Um, are we going to apply these same kind of virtual consultations or some of the innovations that you all had to create in response to COVID-19 to uh, resuming or returning to whatever is going to be the new normal? So what does the future look like? And then when was Operation Smile Nicaragua founded? And uh, when was so, your office open? So I think the office has been open since 25 years ago. We did have like a kind of partnership in the odontology or dental part for patients since its creation. We tried to open up a center in 2012, but it was basically two consultations, one of surgeon, one of dental. It, it wasn't until 2016 that we actually could ramp up from to 10 specialties attending um, the center. At the moment, they have 18 specialties and almost like 24 services trying to support what they're trying they're, they're doing towards care. And I think for the future, um, I'll talk for the region and I'll let Tati talk for Nicaragua, but like for the region, us RDs are looking this as uh, regional directors. I'm sorry, sometimes I I just too much um, <laughs> um SRDs are trying to see this in like a multi multi-solution kind of thing. So first, just to treat COVID like COVID, nothing's happening much more than that. But like the three areas we're trying to target is first patients that go to the center, how we could get them back to centers. The second one is patients that can go to center but not that frequently, how are we going to provide care for them? And then the third one is how are we going to provide care for those patients who cannot access the center? And still, like, like the best thing is to get care at the center, but how can we continue and just take this moment to be resilient and be stronger after it and just like take care of all the sectors of patients? Because we we wasn't taking great care of that sector that couldn't go to the center, but now we have a unique opportunity of just like rolling it out for everybody and just making the world more healthy and and better. And I'll let Tati talk to, about Nicaragua. Thank you, Indiana. I think, uh, I hope uh, we can open this or center in few months ago. Uh, sorry, a uh, few months. Um, I want, I, I, really, I want to open the, the center in three or four months, but we don't know with uh, COVID uh, 19 here in Nicaragua. Uh, maybe, but we want to uh, continue provide uh, consultation and a clinic online. Um, then doesn't doesn't happen happen if we open the center. Uh, for some patients, we need to uh, provide. Um, provide consultation online because uh, some patients can come to Managua for the uh, for a, a consultation and the uh, clinic online is a, a is a new it's a new method uh, for continue to provide a consultation and we found more patients we are uh, we are con uh, receiving continuum uh, con we are uh, continue receiving patient, new patient, and some patient can come Nicaragua, uh, Managua. Uh, the clinic online is the best way for those patients. Awesome. Yeah, I'm absolutely 100% available for to creating like a program, like for the ones at the center and the ones that I cannot reach us. Yeah, definitely, we're doing that. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, the things we've had to do to adapt are new opportunities and definitely the silver lining that we can make from this unfortunate situation. Um, but again, I want to thank each of you, Scarlett, Tatiana, Indiana, for joining us today and for everybody who joined us um, online. We appreciate your time this afternoon. We'll be sharing a recording of the event in the next in the coming days. And please always stay tuned to our blog and social media for the latest and greatest that we have uh, with regard to our COVID response. Um, on behalf of Laura and everyone online, take care. Bye-bye.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, team.